Hello, Muriel. Registering. So, dear rock mechanics colleague, my name is Muriel Gask and I'm the ISRM vice president for Europe. Today, it's uh, our sixth debate since the first one in 2021. These debates are created to stimulate communication among academics and practitioners of rock mechanics and rock engineering in Europe and all around the world. And I would like to remind everyone that uh, all former debate can still be seen on, a, on our ISRM uh, YouTube channel. So don't hesitate to go there and have a look. So before giving the floor to our moderator, Philippe Vascu, uh, our ISRM vice president, CEO Con John, sent me a video to be shared as he was not able to be here with us today. So I will try to share it. Yeah. <laughs> So just a second with that. Philippe, can you just tell me if you can see my screen? It works. Yes. OK, so I hope you will hear everything. I just. There is no sound. No sound. No sound? No sound. Ha, ha, ha. I can hear him. I will try this one. No. So, well, perhaps we can start the debate and I'll try yeah. to, to do something with the video during this okay. time. I'm sorry for that. So, okay. Philippe, the floor is to you. Yeah. Okay. Again, uh, I will apologize for this uh, delay due to technical issues. Um, today, this is the sixth debate and we have a lot of attendees today which is very good for for the rsrm and also it uh, it means that uh, uh, the subject as well as the two speakers we have today are very attractive and very interesting so our first speaker uh, is a uh, professor joseph labus from the university of minnesota in the united states uh, professor labus is working uh, on, in rock mechanics for a long time. He's a well-known uh, guy uh, in the ISRM. Uh, you can have some details about his, uh, his bio in the flyer. I just want to add one point that is, is the, the author, the principal author of the ISRM suggested method regarding the more Coulomb failure criteria which is uh, in the RSRM, the, the, uh, the real procedure to, to work with this uh, failure criteria. Well, uh, since we are already a bit late, I don't want to speak too much. So Joe, uh, you can start with your presentation uh, for you. about uh, 15 minutes. That's Thank up you. to you. Uh, would you allow me to share a screen? I mm -hmm. have to do it. Uh... I have to find you, sorry. <laughs> Too many things in the, in the same time. So, sorry, just a second. So now you should be able to do it. Yes, thank you.
Yes, I'd like to first thank um, Muriel and Philippe for the invitation to participate in the ISRM European Rock Mechanics Debate Series. It's a great honor for me. Again, thank you. I'd like to start out, um, of course, with the title. Um, we will be talking about failure criterion, um, but this, of course, can also apply for other states of stress, such as those associated with yield. But for the most part, in terms of the discussion, uh, experimental data that I'll be presenting, uh, this will be so-called uh, at failure. Uh, I would also like uh, to uh, give a few comments on in a, an extension of the more Coulomb failure criterion, and I've titled this uh, a generalized linear theory. There are many individuals uh, that I'd like to acknowledge that have contributed to my understanding and some of the work that I'm presenting uh, today, and, and they're noted uh, here on the title slide. So let me start out with recognizing, of course, two giants in our field, um, Coulomb, who's contributed uh, in many areas of science and engineering, specifically for us uh, as it relates to so-called sheer strength of, I'll say, geomaterials. And of course, the contribution of Coulomb was in recognizing that there are two terms that contribute to the resistance that a material such as soil or rock has to certain types of loading. And we think of these uh, components as one associated with a scalar quantity, quantity, so-called cohesion, and one associated with pressure dependence, what we often refer to as friction or internal friction or angle of internal friction. Uh, certainly uh, another major contribution as it pertains to soil and rock is due to Moore, who we can say generalized this concept in terms of the construction of an envelope associated with various states of stress. So certainly uh, an important item as it pertains to strength theory is to compare a so-called theory with actual experiments. So let's uh, review because I believe all of us are quite uh, familiar with this more Coulomb failure criterion. As I said, it starts with experiments, typically because of the way we sample the material. That is, we obtain a right circular cylinder, so-called core, that we then subject to various stress states. And convenient stress states are one where two principal stresses are equal. I'll be using the notation for st principal stresses with regard to order as Roman numeral one, two, and three for the major, intermediate, and minor. And this convenient stress state involves two principal stresses being equal. For so-called conventional triaxial compression, the minor and intermediate are equal to the confining pressure, whereas for conventional triaxial extension, the intermediate would be equal to the major principal stress. So we perform experiments. I'm showing some results here, both for triaxial compression, this axisymmetric state of stress, as well as triaxial extension. We plot this information on, uh, for example, a Moore diagram, where of course these stress states are represented by a circle, or we could use other type of stress um, invariants to analyze this information. So I'm showing another example, and I'll define these quantities shortly, but P being the mean stress and Q being the deviator or the shear stress. And uh, on this diagram, of course, these stress states are simply represented by points. And uh, depending upon the range 
of confining stresses or mean stress in which we're uh, performing these experiments. The failure envelope in terms of a Moore diagram may appear as a nonlinear type of relation. Or if we look at um, a certain range of mean stress, we may be able to identify a linear portion. And of course, this linear portion of the failure envelope, we identify as the more Coulomb failure criterion. Uh, I'll not, I will not be speaking about experiments where fluid pressure is acting, but again, from exper experiments, from uh, observation, um, we know that uh, the representation of effective stress is what we need to follow then in uh, identifying these failure conditions. So of course, on the Moore diagram, this linear relation takes this form where S0 is um, the cohesion, or I'll be calling it the shear strength intercept, and the angle that's measured from the normal stress axis is this angle of internal friction, uh, symbolized by the Greek letter phi. Another feature of the more Coulomb failure criterion that doesn't always follow from experiments is that we can predict the orientation of the failure plane of the shear band that typically forms from this type of loading. And that's given by this angle phi, which is angle beta, excuse me, which is a function of the angle of internal friction. Another parameter that I'd like to identify is this intercept with the failure envelope and the sigma n axis, the normal stress axis and I'll be using the symbol V0. And of course, there are other parameters that we can identify. C0 is what I'll be using for the uniaxial compressive strength, and I'll talk shortly about the tensile strength associated with rock. Okay, as I mentioned, there are other types of representations that we could use. Another convenient one is to look at principal stress plane. And on this um, representation of principal stresses given by Roman numerals, so sigma one is the major and sigma three being the minor principal stresses, we have this type of representation where again, we can identify material parameters, uniaxial compressive strength, and I'm calling T zero, the value of the tensile strength that would be predicted from the more Coulomb failure criterion, but is not measured in our experiments. Of course, the slope of this line is related to the angle of internal friction. Now, there are other um, things we can look at. Um, we don't need to keep this ordering of principal stresses and we'll see why this is convenient. Um, but there are six orderings if we simply represent now the principal stresses by Arabic numbers. So sigma one, two, and three are simply principal stresses that can take on the different values of major, intermediate, and minor. So within this representation where sigma one can be major or minor, sigma three can be major or minor, we have this representation of the more Coulomb failure criterion with now the addition of a so-called tension cutoff where we recognize that T0 is not measured in experiments, rather the uniaxial tensile strength is represented by T is what is measured. Uh, that representation of the tension cutoff is shown here on the Moore diagram. And now we can expand this representation of our failure criterion by taking advantage of the principal stress space with regard, without regard to order. And we have this diagram, this representation of a pyramidal failure surface associated with more Coulomb. And of course, the tension cutoff is shown by these three planes, 
uh, being the, the prism that intersects this six-sided pyramid. An important feature of this diagram is the plane that's perpendicular to this line that is shown in the dotted representation. And this plane is referred to as the equal potential plane or the pi plane. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview on uh, more Coulomb. And now I'll simply mention some of the positive and maybe not so positive features of this theory. Uh, certainly uh, a positive feature is the uh, simplicity of, uh, of this representation. So it's a linear equation uh, as represented by the major and minor principal stresses. Uh, because we've used this for a number of years, now we have recognizable parameters where we often identify these as so-called material parameters, but of course they're simply fitting uh, parameters that are associated with uh, this type of interpretation. And because it's been around for a number of years and it is quite useful uh, for solving many problems in geomechanics, there's this general level of acceptance. Now, there are some disadvantages. Certainly we know that the failure envelope is nonlinear if we look over a large range of mean stress. So I'm showing some data now on a diagram of P and Q, so mean stress versus deviator stress. I've linearized this data and I'll talk about that shortly, but certainly this representation would be one associated with a nonlinear failure surface. Another difficulty with this failure criterion is the appearance of corners as represented on the equipotential plane or the pi plane. So certainly if we want to take into account deformation that occurs, for example, if we use this as a yield condition, then the strain rate vector would be at some angle to this failure surface. And we have some ambiguity when we look at the corner because on one grouping of these principal stresses, certainly the direction is identified. In fact, it's constant along the edge. But if we look at a different grouping, of course, we have a different orientation. So these corners present some difficulty with regard to, I'll call it deformation analysis. And of course, another criticism, whether it's justified or not, is that in terms of principal stresses, we're only considering two and sigma two does not appear. Okay, so in the next few minutes, I just like to, and please, uh, Philippe, uh, I lost track of time in terms of when I started. So please stop me uh, at uh, 15 minutes or at 14 minutes. Um, but I'd like to review some, some um, background that applies to uh, most failure criteria uh, that we discuss. And that is, I'd like to emphasize that our approach is typically phenomenological. That is, it, it's empirical. We perform experiments and we observe behavior. Um, we choose to typically to define this failure criterion based on stress, stress state. We don't have to, but I would say that's the most convenient. And certainly, we know there are six components uh, associated with this stress state. And we can identify those six components based on three principal stresses in three directions. For an isotropic material, direction does not matter. So we're down to three components that we need to work with. And then of course, if we relax this ordering of stresses, we have this six orderings where this failure surface becomes uh, this um, pyramid in principal stress space. Now we know that 
rock soil behaves as a pressure dependent material, the so-called frictional behavior. And certainly the simplest representation is to take sigma one and sigma three, this linear relation. And we have the famil familiar more Coulomb failure criterion, but there's no reason why we couldn't consider all three principal stresses in this linear combination. And this failure criterion then is much richer in the information that it provides in terms of behavior. Excuse me, okay. Joe. Two, two minutes, please. Two minutes? Okay. Yes, please. So uh, again, this is just a review in terms of, for example, uh, certain features of principal stress space of this failure surface, the hydrostatic axis being associated with the principal stresses being equal along this line. A plane perpendicular to this axis is the pi plane. On this plane, the mean stress is constant. So uh, another convenient representation is to look at the distance along the hydrostatic axis, the mean stress. The distance in the pi plane, the radial distance, is, which is a measure of the shear stress. And of course, the angle uh, associated with the state of stress, which is what we refer to as the Lodi angle. And there are other invariants that we can choose, such as the invariants that I've identified with at least a rectangular uh, coordinate system on the pi, pi plane. And these are the sigma d, that's just the distance along the hydrostatic axis, and then uh, sigma e and sigma f in the pi plane. So I'd like to finish uh, just reviewing with you again what I said in terms of we need to perform experiments. Typically it's axisymmetric loading, but I'd like to point out that if indeed we conduct compression and extension experiments, it's possible that we observe two friction angles. And the appearance of these two friction angles is one way of thinking about it is because of the dependence of sigma two. So we can take that into account by following a suggestion that was, uh, that was contributed by Burton Paul uh, in a paper that was published in 1968 in the International Journal of Solids and Structures. And he suggested this type of representation. In addition, he suggested that there's no reason to stop with one plane. We could linearize this nonlinear behavior by including more planes to represent this nonlinearity. So I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe, for this uh, interesting, but also very clear presentation. Uh, now we're going to shift to the second speaker, Professor Min Chai from uh, Laurentian University in Canada. Uh, Ming has already published a lot of paper with the ISRM. He's a professor in, uh, in Canada, but he was also former professor in, uh, in China, in Tsinghua University. And he has also worked for the, the, for, with the industry. Uh, no need to speak longer. Uh, I give you uh, the way. Uh, Ming, you can uh, go on if the, the, spring, uh, the screen is shared. Okay, yeah, thank you, Rupert. And uh, okay, good. Share my screen. It works. So, can you see my share screen now? Not yet. No. Perfect. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the hook bomb failure criterion in this event. Uh, as you know, that um, um, in rock engineering design, we all need uh, uh, 
material properties for rock and rock mass uh, for intact rock is uh, relatively easy to uh, get the, these parameters using a laboratory test. For example, you can do UCS test, tension uh, triaxial test to get uh, uh, the test data. And ideally, uh, we're going to use um, a failure envelope or failure criterion to describe the test data. And uh, not only in the compression zone, ideally, you should also cover uh, the data in the tension zone as well. So over the years, um, there have been uh, many uh, failure criterion developed, and this table lists some of the well-known uh, failure criterion. I'm sure most of you uh, know most of this failure criterion, but uh, uh, two, I think, stand out. Uh, one is the Mohr Coulomb. Of course, the other is the Hukba. And this is why we're here today to discuss the pros and cons of those two failure criteria. And for intact work, as I said, we can do a bunch of uh, laboratory tests and collect the data. And then this is uh, the failure criteria who can be developed to describe the strengths of intact work. And in this criterion, you have two parameters. One is mi and the other is sigma c. So those are uh, feeding parameters that uh, you get from by just using the function to feed the data, and then you get those parameters determined. And of course, that uh, uh, in its initial development, the data they have mostly it's in the compression zone, but um, the failure criterion also describe very well and the uh, the tensile strengths of uh, intact rock. For intact rock, as I said, it's easy to do lab tests, but for rock mass that's we're dealing with in rock engineering design, it's very, very difficult to get uh, the mechanical properties of rock mass. But in reality, we need parameters describing the strengths both the peak and residual strengths, as well as deformation modulus for engine design purpose to have those parameters as input to uh, numerical tools, for example. Um, of course, the challenge we have here is uh, really to properly determine those parameters for rock mass at the scale of engineering structures. Now, um, since they uh, have this uh, failure criterion for intact rock, but uh, of course, uh, engineers in the field need uh, uh, something to cover the rock mass, jointed rock mass. This is why uh, Hook and Brown, uh, based on some uh, lab test of jointed rock mass, and they developed this simple table for site engineers to use um, when incorporating the hook brown failure criterion for rock mass. So in this case, you can see you have uh, two parameters, M and S needs to be determined by looking at the table. This table basically is governed by rock mass quality and rock types. And of course that uh, in its initial development, they use C SIR rating and NGI rating to describe the rock quality in this table. And there's only 30 categories that you can choose from. And Hook and Brown realized that the rock mass strength is governed by not just the rock mass quality, but also by the disturbance. And those two together governs the rock mass strength. That's why they seek ways to quantify those two parameters when developing the hook brown criterion for rock mass. 1988, they developed this uh, criterion by linking the parameters M, B, and S to the armor rating. And of course, that um, uh, they also 
divided this into two groups, as you can see, because they realized the important factor, that's the disturbance, also uh, governs the walk mass strengths. But ARMA, as everyone knows, is a parameter originally developed for empirical walk support design. In this reading, you will include walk strengths, intact walk strengths. You include also groundwater conditions, joint orientation adjustment. Those factors should not be included when actually you're describing the rock mass mechanical properties. And this is why uh, there's a need to have a parameter that only describe rock mass structures and uh, the joint surface condition. And uh, so based on uh, that uh, motivation, Hook developed the concept of GSI, that's the Geological Strengths Index. And uh, then they generalized the hook one to uh, the form that you see in this 2002 form. And in this uh, generalized hook one, of course, you still include the original parameter sigma c and mi. Uh, those can be easily determined for laboratory test for intact work. But for GSI, uh, this is a parameter that only depends on rock mass structure and the joint surface condition. And of course, D is a construction factor that reflects the disturbance to rock mass. And they gave a table, everybody knows that. Uh, this is a table that you can consult to, to determine the uh, disturbance factor. Basically, it's a factor ranging from zero to one. And uh, if it's undisturbed, you give a zero. And if it's disturbed, you give one reading. And uh, something in between uh, depends on how uh, you control uh, the blasting and the degree of damage to the rock mass. Of course, the determination of the GSI value is the most critical uh, steps in using the hook bond criterion. And uh, for a criterion that is describing the rock mass properties, uh, it will have no practical value unless it can be related to geology and rock mass condition in the field. And this is uh, the table um, they developed. Uh, we can use to determine the GSI value. Um, you look for the block size, the joint surface condition, and then you can choose the value of GSI from 10 to 85 from this table. Uh, in total, there are about 20 uh, categories we can use. Uh, later, they expanded the table into a chart. And as you can see here, we have a GSI chart. And again, um, you can pick a value based on the tube controlling factor structure and uh, the surface condition. And of course, uh, as we know that the use of the GSI, GSI chart is you require uh, some experience in the field and um, um, it's a little bit uh, subjective, um, requires long-term experience. So um, over the years, uh, many researchers, including uh, Dr. Hook himself, have tried to quantify the GSI chart. And from what I see, there are probably more than uh, 25 different attempts to quantify the GSI chart for use in engineering practice. As a contribution to rock engineering, we also presented a quantitative uh, method to describe GSI. Our approach employs the block volume and joint surface condition factor as quantitative measures to determine GSI and the GSI value based on the generalized uh, hook run is from zero to 100. And the values can be actually determined consistently using field mapping data. And you can do 
uh, detailed mapping using modern uh, Serbian technology to determine the block size and joint condition factors objectively and consistently. And uh, using surface treating technique, we also uh, develop an equation to calculate uh, GSI uh, by using the two controlling parameters, uh, block size and joint condition factor. The advantage of using equation instead of a chart is that you can plug in the equation into your program and then to calculate the GSI value based on uh, the obtained uh, uh, field mapping data. So uh, this makes it easy to use the hookbound uh, model in numerical uh, design analysis. And we can also consider the variability of the geology in engineering design. Another important aspect in engineering design is uh, we need to also look for the residual strengths, not just the peak strengths, because the residual strengths controls also how the rock is going to fail and degrade it. And the, the GSI system provide a logic way to determine the residual strengths of jointed rock mass. All we have to do is to uh, downgrade the peak GSI value to a residual GSI value and using the same set of equations to calculate uh, the material properties for design analysis. For details about the, the degradating process, you can refer to a paper published in 2007. And now, um, as I mentioned, the advantage of using the quantified the GSI system is that we can consider variability of each input parameter and consider uh, that in design analysis. So based on field mapping, we can calculate the variability of joint spacing and surface condition and find the distribution of VB and JC. And uh, normally the block volume has a log normal distribution and GC has a normal distribution. And using the equations we just presented and combined with the Monte Carlo simulation, you can actually find the distribution of the GSI value. And this is a natural product based on field mapping data, considering the uh, variability of joint spacing and surface condition. So uh, using this kind of approach, you can plug uh, those into the FEMLized code. And then, uh, for example, in block support design, we are very interested in the variability of the yielding zone. And this will give you the, uh, that information and assist you for uh, block support design. It is important uh, to know that there are some assumptions uh, for the use of the hook brown criteria for uh, rock and rock mass. Uh, first, first of all, for rock mass, um, we need to keep in mind uh, it's for isotropic, continuous uh, behavior of rock mass. This condition. Please, you yes? please, please, you have two minutes left. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry. thank you. <laughs> um, um, this condition can be easily um, uh, satisfied if you have multiple joint set. And of course, that uh, uh, the intermediate principal stress effect is not uh, considered. And this is actually not a bad thing because by ignoring the sigma T effect, we actually are conducting conservative design, which is normal practice in rock engineering. And of course, uh, we have to assume that the stress is governed by uh, factor stress and there's no loading weight effect. And uh, the hook brine, although it's not as old as the more coolant, uh, these days you can find it in almost all uh, geotechnical engine design tools we use uh, 
today. So uh, just a quick comparison between hook and one. One is nonlinear, one is linear. And of course, uh, the biggest advantage of using hook one is you can link geology to rock mass trends. And this is um, uh, very different from the more cooling. So in conclusion, um, we know that uh, hook run is now widely used in rock engineering design. And uh, we need to keep in mind it's an empirical failure criterion. Uh, you can use it to define rock strengths, use it to estimate rock mass strengths. And uh, GSI is a link between geology and rock mass strengths. We can use field mapping data to determine GSI values and uh, provide uh, uh, the design parameters for design analysis. And this is really, uh, these days, well accepted and effective tools for obtaining uh, the preliminary range of rock mass properties in rock engineering design. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ming. Thanks a lot for this uh, interesting presentation and also for, for presenting the historical aspects and the evolution of this uh, Hook and Brown criteria. Uh, before opening really the debate, I have a question just to, ta to start with. Uh, this question is uh, for both of you. Could you summarize from a practical point of view uh, why using uh, the criterion you have just supported and not using the others, but in, in, a, in, a, in a few words, just to summarize. Yeah, I'll go first. Probably, um, yeah. uh, as I mentioned, um, in rock engineering, we're dealing with rock mass. And uh, definitely, um, if you're design engineers, you need to um, do modeling these days. And to get the modeling parameters, um, hook run is definitely the logic choice uh, because uh, it's there's a linkage uh, from the geology to the model parameters. So that's that's the, the advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is for you the, the major advantage. Yeah. yeah. Joe. Yes. So clearly, uh, and maybe I didn't emphasize it, uh, the discussion that I presented has to do with behavior of a material element. Yeah. So this material element from test to test, experiment to experiment, is assumed to be the same. Certainly, as soon as we introduce discontinuities, that is the behavior of the rock mass, this goes out the window. So <laughs> this is a very challenging problem in geomechanics. And yeah. certainly, Professor Hook and Professor hmm. Brown really uh, advanced uh, the application of rock mechanics to try to provide a representation of what is assumed to be, as Ming said, a material element. But of course, this is this jointed um, rock mass that is then assumed to behave yeah. as a continuum. Yeah. So that's a big step, but one that uh, is certainly needed in practice. Mm -hmm. But however, the more Cullen criterion is still Philippe? used a lot sorry. in the world. Philip, sorry, I, I just want to share uh, Professor Theo John Con is a video if it's possible with you. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. If um, it works. Yeah, it should now. Sorry. Okay, good. Tell me. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues and friends, good afternoon. On behalf of ISRM, I welcome you to the sixth ISRM European debate. It is my honor and privilege to greet you in this debate series. Today, we met to explore an important topic within our field, more Coulomb and Hook and Brown failure criterion. First, I would like to extend my sincere thanks 
to our esteemed speakers, Professor Joseph Leibitz from the University of Minnesota and Professor Ming Kai from Laurentian University. Their exceptional expertise and dedication to advancing rung mechanics and engineering make today's debate a unique learning opportunity. I am equally grateful to Dr. Uh, Philip Basco for moderating this session and ensuring a fruitful exchange of ideas. I am also grateful to Dr. Muriel Gask, ISRM Vice President, for promoting this event. As many of you know, the topic we are discussing today, failure criteria, plays a fundamental role in how we understand the behavior of rank masses, particularly in critical engineering applications such as tunneling, slope stability, and underground construction. The comparison between Moore Coulomb and Hook Brown criterion, each uh, with its own strengths, challenges, and implications, lies at the heart of designing safer, more efficient structures in challenging geological conditions. The ISRM is committed to fostering a culture of scientific collaboration. Today's debate is a perfect example of how we can come together to examine different perspectives. These debates not only reflect our dedication to the highest standards of research, but also to ensure that our work directly impacts the real world challenges. I would also like to acknowledge the audience joining us today. Your presence shows the strength of our international community. I encourage all of you to engage actively in the discussion, share your questions, and contribute to your perspectives. Together, we make these sessions more enriching and insightful. I regret that I cannot attend the debate today as I will be traveling, and I apologize for having to send the video instead. Thank you once again for being here, and I wish everyone an inspiring and enlightening debate. Thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. Let I give okay. you. Thank you, Muriel, for sharing this uh, message from our president. <laughs> well, uh, back to to my previous question, Joe. Uh, the more Coulomb criterion is still widely used. Uh, in, in the world. How can you explain that? Because of its uh, simplicity? So that was to me? I'm, I'm sorry, Philippe, was that question to me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so certainly uh, I would say because of its simplicity, mm -hmm. there are many advantages to simply using a failure criterion that has uh, two <laughs> principal stresses, the major and minor. So mm -hmm. this lends itself then to the very powerful technique of limit analysis or limit equilibrium. And um, within the realm of two-dimensional problems, yeah. uh, this is uh, consistent. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly this, this issue of describing strength of a rock mass is is critical for practice, yeah. but um, it it is beyond uh, what can be, let's say, measured in the laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Muriel, we we're going to open the the discussion, the the real debate to to the online uh, audience. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to read the question? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, is there anyone uh, wanting we to do ask have a, quest a question? Yes, we do have question in the chat. Okay. So perhaps I can ask the question. It's easier than uh, giving the um, the microphone to everyone. So please, could you comment on equivalent uh, more Coulomb parameters obtained from uh, HB criterion and its use in practical application, especially the stress level dependency? Thank you. Oh, I don't know from which one is it. <laughs> so, 
So is that for both of us? Yeah, I think so. Ming, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My I have a response yeah. have to think about. My that. understanding is that uh, yes, you can get uh, equivalent more coulomb from foot burn, but depends on the problem that you you're dealing with. And um, if, for uh, example, in underground mining, we're dealing with uh, uh, rock failure around the, the tunnels, and you you want to get uh, the equivalent to more coulomb in the low confinement zone, not the, the high confinement. And this will be most appropriate for use if you want to use the equivalent more coulomb. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, my response would be uh, so-called equivalent parameters, from my understanding, are to extend behavior that we observe, for example, in axisymmetric compression to other types of stress states. And um, certainly that, that could be important depending upon the type of problem, but I would say that experiments should be performed at those other stress states to investigate the, this type of behavior that may change depending upon stress state. So I gave a very simple example of axisymmetric extension and it's possible that we do observe that the material behaves differently, behaves differently with respect to, for example, this friction angle. Well, that can be included by this extension that I mentioned that's due to Paul, that we refer to as this Paul Moore Coulomb failure criterion. So um, it's possible uh, to extend or to find an equivalent it, it just that it's better to have more information about how the material behaves. For example, not only in compression, axisymmetric compression, but extension. We have other questions on the on the chat. Next one. I have a question to Dr. Shai. Chai. How can you make a comment on the dependency of scale in GSI? A tunnel or pillar versus a curving application would result in different GSI values. So based on problem scale, it would affect rock mass or strength or rock block strength. I would love to hear Dr. Chai's comment on this and the representative elementary volume. Well, yeah. That's that's a difficult question to <laughs> sure. ask. But um, um, as we know that um, um, when you are using um, the hook brand, uh, the assumption already I mentioned in my presentation is that you need to consider um, this as a equivalent continuum isotropic material. Mm -hmm. And that's the underlying assumption uh, behind the whole thing. So um, if you're considering um, different uh, scale of structures, of course, that uh, there's a limit that uh, based on the, uh, the spacing that uh, your rock mass uh, joint spacing uh, you're dealing with. So there's a limit that uh, probably things both done in, in terms of the applicability of the um, the criterion that we use. But in general, um, um, I think uh, I haven't seen anyone specifically uh, dealing with the scale effect in the GSI. Uh, what we actually do is to uh, do field mapping to determine the, uh, for example, the block size mm -hmm. uh, Block size, you have a, a certain distribution size in terms of um, um, you know uh, relative to the scale of the structure you're dealing with. Uh, if um, you have a very high GSI value, uh, leading to um, GSI more than eighty or ninety, close to one hundred. So those are the case that uh, definitely uh, the system is not uh, really. Um, work well in those range of GSI values, and uh, but it definitely works very well 
uh, in the lower range, when you have uh, something less than 70 or you know, 65 in that range. So um, that's that's the common practice as I, I know. And to address specifically security factor of GSI value, definitely needs to um, have more research in that aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have another very interesting question on the chat regarding Sigma 2. So which one, meaning which criterion, should be used when Sigma 2 is needed? In reservoir geomechanics and drilling geomechanics, the information on Sigma 2 is needed to ensure accurate wellbore trajectory design or perforation direction. So what about Sigma 2? Well, there are a number of failure criterion, criteria, excuse me, yes. that do include all three principal stresses. Um, and I'm not going to promote one over the other. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is this um, very simple form of uh, extending the more Coulomb criterion. Uh, by including uh, in the linear equation, mm -hmm. uh, a sigma two term um, can capture uh, behavior that uh, more complex failure criteria capture. So yeah. I think uh, that this work by Paul was largely ignored uh, by the geomechanics community. And I, um, in promoting the use of um, this, this uh, piecewise linear criterion that can be used. Okay. Another question uh, that is also for you, Professor Labouze. For the sake of presentation, you ignored biot coefficient, but you have done a lot of work on that. Any comment how we update more Coulomb with alpha for effective stress consideration. Yeah, so of course, uh, the, the so-called BO coefficient is associated with, I'll describe it as poroelastic response. We're talking about yield or failure. So yeah. that um, uh, behavior then uh, does not strictly apply. So I did make the comment that it's observed from experiments that this simple form of the often called the effective stress relationship yeah. holds for yield and failure. So um, we're talking, it, it's, it's two different concepts. And again, my comment is just based on, uh, based on experiments that there's yeah. no uh, theoretical, um, um, support for such a relation. <laughs> okay. Uh, another one. Question for both speakers. Which failure criteria is the most practical when the rock mass has a bad quality for a foundation project br bridge, for example, on high loads? Um, we're speaking about rock mass, so I think the the answer is already in the question. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll um, promote the hook bar for for that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, in addition to that, when saying uh, we can use a. Uh, Hook Brown uh, criterion. Yeah, rock mass. Ah, bello, especially. Yeah. Muriel, we had some problems with. Uh... Yeah, I'll try to find which who is speaking to. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, is it is it uh, so simple, uh, Ming, to use uh, Hook Brown uh, criterion, and especially when the quality of the rock mass is is low? 
Because it non looks premeli, 60 looks volte, simple. uno alla volta. It looks simple on the chart, but in the reality, I mean, pra in practical matters, is it so simple to get an accurate value? Yeah. The um, of the GSR. Yeah. Of course, that uh, um, as we all know that uh, any of those models, particularly uh, Hukwang, it's just the starting point for engineers to get an estimate of block mass strengths so you can start your design process. And it's never said that you're going to just uh, do uh, whatever you have and then um, just do one iteration of design and the things are okay. But um, in reality, uh, for bad rock, uh, moderate quality or good quality rock, um, you still need to follow the standard engineering design process mm -hmm. by uh, incorporating uh, the behavior monitoring in the design process and then adjust your design parameters on the way. Uh, we've lost you, Ming. Yeah. And in this way, you can for good quality, bad quality, the same approach should be applied. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Uh, question for both panelists. At present, which constitutive model is best suited for capturing the mechanical and hydraulic interactions of anisotropic rock? Uh, it has been shown that crystallized rock can be anisotropic. Well, and I would add, not only crystallized rock. <laughs> yeah, so of course, anisotropy complicates things uh, greatly. And um, there uh, have uh, been proposed a, a, a few. Uh, very good anisotropic um, models, uh, but uh, a number of the things that I presented, of course, do not apply and uh, directional dependence, um, of course, it needs to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I don't have a specific recommendation. Uh, I would need to review some things before uh, yeah. And I make a comment. So if someone would like to contact me, I just give me a few days to review some yeah. things before I make such a recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, those those uh, criteria um, are not for anisotropic material properties. Uh, yeah. So if really you're dealing with that uh, aspect, um, they are not applicable in the strict sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ming, another question, which is for you. Uh, Professor Chai, what's the difference between global rock mass strength and uniaxial strength? Yeah, I'm not sure the question, but uh, when we talk about the uh, rock mass strengths, rock mass include discontinuities, right? Mm -hmm. And in type right. rock, you have only some uh, micro cracks. Mac yeah, matrix. Rock, uh, intact rock. So, yeah. um, but the concept of strengths um, is what we talk about the failure envelope. So, unitary loading is just a specific case uh, in terms of defining the strengths. So, it's a special loading condition. Okay? Strengths is a, is a concept that uh, when, we, when we draw the, the failure envelope, it should cover the whole range of loading conditions from uh, triaxial compression to uniaxial compression to tensile loading. So that's the concept of strength. So uh, if you relate to that, it'll be easy to figure out the relation between um, you know, the so-called strengths, global strengths and uniaxial strengths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Another one for both uh, presenters. In numerical assessments, what is your opinion on the importance of the ground model representation and heterogeneity versus the strength representation of the elements within a ground model? For example, multiple lithology zones or characteristic fracturing and local discrete fractures, which may dominate the response. Difficult question. Yeah, so I mean, I'll go first. Maybe. Yes. Uh, again, as I said, uh, we're looking in terms of uh, the discussion um, that I presented and the material element mm -hmm. behavior. As soon as we introduce discontinuities, certainly that complicates the response. So uh, not only in terms of heterogeneity, but also in terms of anisotropy. So um, to, do, to, to handle such problems um, explicitly, that is taking into account uh, specific orientation of joints uh, you know, can be done, but certainly then we need uh, a failure criterion for those discontinuities. Um, so again, in terms of what I presented and may mention yeah. it as well, that this is on the continuum scale that somehow he is uh, homogenizing this uh, heterogeneous uh, and isotropic, possibly material, into one that is uh, represented on a continuum level that is uh, behaving isotropically. Well, that doesn't really answer your question. No, no, no. Just uh, trying to again explain the limitations of of mm -hmm. the, the isotropic assumption continuum approach. Yeah, the opportunity saying it uh, depends on the scale. If you are dealing with um, a rock mass with different uh, rock types, right? Different uh, degree of jointing. Um, if you have a uh, very good uh, geological information in your numeric models, you can divide uh, those different zone into different zoning and then apply different uh, uh, rock mass characterization to define the uh, input parameters for those different zones. And that's probably, uh, I understand, is the heterogeneity that you are talking about. So that's relatively easy to handle in numerical models if it's a large scale type. Well, for small scale, then, you know, it's a different thing that you, you have to <laughs> use uh, some different uh, modeling approach. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, for both of you, but maybe more for regarding for, for Joe. Can you compare uh, the criterion you have supported to Griffith one? Yeah, uh, so I can go. Um, the Griffith criterion I would describe as a micro mechanical model. So it's a particular uh, uh, type of uh, failure that's occurring due to a flaw fracture within mm -hmm. uh, the material. Um, the, the, the good thing about the Griffin criterion is it is uh, nonlinear on uh, the Moore diagram. Uh, the limitation, of course, is the, the, um, the set ratio of um, compressive strength to tensile strength that appears, mm -hmm. and that's not often observed. So uh, the 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 positive oh, thing yeah. it it is uh, nonlinear, but in, in actually applying it to to most rock, it doesn't um, represent uh, the response that we uh, we observe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I I can maybe add a, uh, some comments to this yeah. as well. Um, the Griffiths failure criterion is a theoretical one, and about the the hook bond is uh, an empirical one. Uh, both of them shows similar uh, curvature, 
and uh, according to book and uh, the book plan actually was inspired by the uh, Griffiths failure criterion in terms of the function uh, type. And uh, so that's um, uh, the difference. And if we only consider the fifth, uh, the Griffiths failure criterion, uh, it described very well the crack initiation of the uh, intact rock. And, mm. uh, but uh, for, for rock, we know that uh, uh, under compression, crack initiation is still far away from actual failure. So uh, that's why there's uh, some limitation if you want to use the Griffiths failure criterion to define the peak uh, strength of uh, of rock, and it's only describing the initiation. Uh, yes, describe yeah. very well the initiation. Uh, mm. So the envelope. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. It regards with uh, the real initiation process of the of the failure. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, another question to Professor Labouth. Thank you for your for the presentation. Can you please comment? on the application of Morkulon criterion on grain scale rock breakage. <laughs> um, okay. um, I, I'm not sure if this question is being directed towards uh, so-called um, particle modeling uh, and determining some type of uh, conditions for failure at the particle level. So certainly similar types of approaches with regard to uh, a um, cohesion or tensile strength, as well as some friction parameter is often used in these particle models, but how they relate to uh, the macroscopic behavior that we interpret in this way um, is not a one-to-one -one relationship. So oftentimes mm -hmm. these, I can call them micro-mechanical parameters, uh, are not directly related to the, the angle of internal friction, the shear stress intercept that we observe from experiments. It, it's usually driven by trying to match what we observe in experiments and adjusting these parameters while trying to satisfy other, other rules with regard to either scaling or other type of uh, phenomenon that we're trying mm -hmm. to capture. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Another question uh, also for you, Joe. The Morkulon criterion can also be as expressed in terms of stress invariants, including J1, J2, and J3, which contain sigma2. Based on that, this, is the Morkulon criterion still independent of sigma2? Well, in the strict sense, yes. So certainly, uh, I agree that we can write more Coulomb using different stress invariants. And uh, the, the stress invariants, of course, are interpreted in a certain way where sigma two may be present and depending upon the loading it has to be considered. But um, in terms of writing it in with principal stresses, of course, it doesn't appear. So uh, I said uh, a way of thinking about the, the other invariants is with regard to uh, a mean stress value, a deviatoric value, a deviatoric stress value, mm -hmm. and a stress state shape value, that is this load angle. And certainly more Coulomb has all three of those features, but again, writing it as a function of, which we can do, principal stresses, of course, sigma two doesn't appear. Mm -hmm. And I said it quickly, I mean, to get it to appear, we have to perform these uh, axisymmetric tests, not only for compression, but also extension to see indeed if the friction angle there is different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Uh, question for both of you. If we are to judge large rock volumes, how do we model 
the variations of GSI throughout the ground model. Do we have experience that this takes in typical forms, in typical rock masses? Oh, no, in typical rock mass classes. So the problem is to judge large rock volumes. So basically, I think this question uh, is for you, uh, Ming. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you're dealing with a large rock mass and um, yeah. in the geotechnical um, survey stage, you can collect uh, information about the rock mass quality from different techniques using borehole data, you know, um, uh, surface mapping. So if you have those isolated data points and you can use uh, the geostatist technique to do uh, to create a, a, a block model for GSI, and that will hopefully covers the variation of GSI through the volume that you're dealing with. So this is very similar to the mineral resources estimation using the block model to estimate the distribution of uh, all grade in a volume in a given volume. So this type of technique can be used to describe the GSI variation in a ball. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, another one. For deep engineering projects, even hard, brittle rock mass show time-dependent behavior. Any comment on how to use failure theory for this problem? That's a tough one. So as Not that simple. Ming stated, I didn't, but certainly it applies uh, rate independence. Um, and what the question refers to is yeah, this problem of rate dependence. Um, so I don't have a response how to uh, use for example, more Coulomb failure criterion for those conditions, other than to perform experiment experiments at those uh, conditions. So stress state, as well as then this um, rate dependence, whatever that may be, and uh, evaluating parameters based on those conditions. Uh, a question. Uh, during site investigation, uh, at the very beginning of a campaign, we generally have only a few uh, core boreholes, and then we can very easily sample some some cores. Uh, which, what what is the the the, the most simple way to assess uh, a failure criteria uh, based only? On, on, on course. I mean, not having queries, outcrops, and things like that. Yeah, so certainly, uh, so I'll go, Ming. Uh, so certainly, uh, the, the availability of uh, material of the rock to perform testing is yep. uh, can be a very uh, important consideration, limitation. And I, I've, I've stated a few times that I'm promoting not only axisymmetric compression, but also extension. But of course, that requires more material. So um, it, it is possible because it, it, there are, are certain types of behavior. So I said it quickly that we may want to capture. So I identified one type of behavior where we can get different response depending upon the stress state. And the example is just axisymmetric compression or extension being a different friction angle, different shear stress intercept. Um, and the, the, the ability to extract that information, of course, requires testing where we can determine these other parameters. So that's certainly a limitation 
with mm -hmm. regard to how much material we have and how many tests we can perform. Yeah. The other is, of course, the nonlinearity that takes place over range of mean stress. Again, we can capture that using piecewise linear approximation, but we need to have enough tests to identify this type mm -hmm. of behavior. So, I mean, I don't have an answer in guiding you on how many tests. I can tell you how many parameters you would need for yeah. these different types of models to capture some of this behavior that may or may not be important for a particular project that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Additional comment, me? No. Yeah, I think I agree with yeah. uh, the same, yeah. Okay. Um, for both, um, could you please clarify the limitations if any, in both criteria, when the rock mass shows these behaviors, creep, dissolving material with water, swollen rock, or time-dependent behavior. Thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely something that uh, shows uh, very. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a something that uh, both criterion, in my opinion, probably is not uh, able to handle those conditions very well. <laughs> yeah, you need the specific uh, models to deal with those uh, sure. behaviors. Yeah, because th these are really difficult and rather exceptional conditions, of course, not yeah. standard ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, I, I would only add because we we touched on this rate dependence problem and yeah. another question. And, and now the, the questionnaire brings up another uh, very important point, possibly depending upon the situation, is degradation. Uh, for example, chemical degradation. So certainly uh, that would uh, influence material response. And my suggestion would be, again, to perform experiments under those conditions to see how these uh, fitting parameters may be modified, may be changed because of, of this other environment. Okay. Else you have to resort to more sophisticated uh, constitutive models yeah, sure. that take into account uh, mm -hmm. these certain features. Yeah, thank you. Uh, question to for Professor Chai, but probably for both. You mentioned in your presentation the ITASCA software FLAC 3D and 3DEC. In order to model fractured rock, do you think that the combination of the Hook Brown failure criterion for the rock matrix and the Morkulan criterion for the joints could be a good match? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, for for joint behavior, I think uh, more cooling is definitely very good, very suitable, and um, in addition to Barton Bandy's model, right? Mm. So yeah, definitely yes. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I have no more. Uh, Sorry, I was muted. Uh, would you oh, allow yes. me to sorry, share sorry. screen? So uh, I was prepared for a debate where I could say something where uh, one is better than the other. Oh. So I can't really say something that more Coulomb was better than Hook Brown, but I can say something about poor Paul Moore Coulomb. So I'll just do this very quick. Yes, um, yes, yes, please. Yeah, I... So uh, one way, of course, of judging a failure criterion. Now, it shouldn't be the only way. Yeah. So... It is to, to look at how uh, we predict, right? We perform experiments. Uh, we come up with uh, some parameters for this failure criterion. Then we want to apply it in other conditions. So we can use experiments to, to fit the behavior and then other experiments to, to, to evaluate the fitting. And, and that's what I'm showing here, basically, is the use of Hook Brown 
I didn't talk about it, but if we make the assumption that Paul Moore Coulomb has the same uh, friction angle and compression and extension, but take into account the nonlinearity by using piecewise linear segments, we would get a four parameter model. If we use the full, uh, not full, but Paul Moore Coulomb with regard to the two plane fitting, where we have different behavior and extension and compression, then it's six parameters. So certainly that's a limitation because I need then more experiments to get these, uh, this behavior. But if I compare certain types of materials, so this is uh, two different sandstones and a siltstone, you see the fitting that we're, uh, or the evaluation that we're uh, using in, uh, with regard to a measure of deviatoric stress. Um, these piecewise linear approximations do a very good job as compared to, for example, a hook brown criterion that doesn't include the intermediate principal stress. Now, certainly I could represent these as one of the questioners brought up. I could represent these failure criteria using different invariants, and that's what I'm showing on this slide. So uh, within this rectangular coordinate system of sigma E and sigma F associated with the pi plane and sigma D is the mean stress. Um, and you see, of course, each one has a representation for these parameters, but um, at least for these examples that I'm showing, and, I'm, and certainly I recognize there could be other examples where Hook Brown does better. But that's something that we didn't really talk about in terms of how do we evaluate a failure criterion. Now, it shouldn't be the only thing we look at, but it's, it's one of them. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry about that. Try to get in a couple no, that, more minutes. <laughs> that, that's fine. Slides I didn't show. <sighs> okay, I have... Uh... Another question, I think it's the last one. What methodologies do you employ to validate the predictive accuracy of hook brown parameters in complex geological settings? Particularly, how to account for degrading effects of water on rock, on rock strength? Well, I can Maybe. just make a comment. Of course, there are two effects of a fluid such as water. One mm -hmm. is a so-called effective stress uh, effect, that is uh, the fluid pressure that's acting. And the other is what's touched on by another questionnaire, and that is the, the chemical effect. And these are uh, both very important. One, we know very well how to, how to handle, that is through effective yeah. stress. And the other is more difficult. And I would say, depending upon the conditions that experiments would need to be performed to see uh, how this uh, degradation occurs uh, within uh, the framework of a certain type of model, such as more Coulomb or hook brown. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the best way to uh, validate uh, the model that you're using is uh, through the approach of back analyze. And uh, this is a, a standard engineering practice. And uh, so you need to uh, obtain um, data, monitoring data, and use this information to um, refine the model that you are using. Uh, any model you use, it's Hoopan, Morkulon, whatever or other models that you use. So this this is because any model is just a, a, a simplification of reality. It's not the exact replication of reality. So always there's uh, some assumption made and uh, uh, in order to uh, gradually approach reality, you need to uh, can constantly uh, refine your model based on the response that you see from the field. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Muriel? Yeah. Yeah, uh, for me it's over. Uh, yes. So a few it. words of conclusion. First, I just before you, I would like to thank again uh, our two presenters, 
Professor Labouz and Professor Chai. Thanks a lot because we had a lot of attendees today, uh, meaning the quality of the presentations. We have already received a lot of chats saying thanks a lot, thanks about the, the quality and the excellence of the presentation. So, well, I want to transmit this to you. Thanks again, Muriel. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to both of you. Well, thanks to the three of you uh, for uh, organizing this meeting. And well, it was, yes, more than 130 people connected in the same time. So it was really great, uh, great things, I think. And well, I just want to remember you once again that you can uh, reload and uh, re go to the YouTube channel to mm. see the question and to see the presentation if you were late. If you miss something because of the, you know, the, the Wi-Fi or something like that, please go to the YouTube channel and see the debate again. And thanks a lot to debaters, to Philippe, the moderators, and to all the attendees. And, uh, well, I hope to see you soon on another debate that will yes. be announced one day on another. We'll see when. <laughs> okay. Bye. And thanks, thanks again. again. Bye-bye. Thank, right. Thank you, Philippe. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye, Joe. Bye-bye, Ming. Thanks.